Hey friends, Patrick here and today is the day .NET 8 will be released or it already has been released depending on when you're watching this video, right? And today also the .NET Web Academy opens its doors for enrollment, but as always only for two weeks and after this enrollment period doors are closed for at least three months. So check out the link in the video description if you're interested, because this time it is huge. You get access to the already existing 2023 edition of the .NET Web Academy, meaning a 20 hour program where you pretty much learn everything related .NET web development, web APIs, SQL Server, and of course, Blazor WebAssembly for the client, meaning we used .NET 7 to build that, but of course, I already added chapters and lectures regarding .NET 8. So you will already be able to start using .NET 8 to build your WebAssembly full stack application using .NET and also with enrolling to the .NET Web Academy 2024 edition, you get early access to a complete new program using all the new Blazor capabilities, all the random modes, the new identity, what we're also doing in this tutorial here, right? So lots and lots of stuff to learn. I hope you like it. I would love to see you in the Academy. Again, for all the information, check out the link in the video description. And in this tutorial now, we will have a look at the new, well, it's not that new, but the new authentication and authorization. Yes, we will use roles, possibilities, capabilities of Blazor and identity, meaning we will have a look at how, well, identity in essence works. How is this done with Entity Framework and SQL Server? Yes, we're using a persistent database there with SQL Server Express in this tutorial. We will have a look at all the new pages that will be generated for us. Maybe you already know it when you used identity before you had to scaffold the pages, you were able to change them, but these weren't really Razor components, right? Or Blazor pages, you name it. And now you have real Razor components available, beautiful stuff. We'll have a look at that. We will have a look at how they work. And then additionally, what we will do is we will add properties to the uh, application user. So how can you, well, extend your user, work with the data then. And at the end, we will also add roles. So how not only uh, does authentication work, I also wanna show you how authorization works, right? And then we'll see the authentication state providers, how do they work? You've got an authentication state provider in the, well, let's say server universe and also one in the WebAssembly universe. So they have to communicate, how does this look like? And in the end, how do you use any component page or a single component, the authorized view, if you already know that, for instance, how can you use this thing to, well, enable access to a user with a specific role. So this is what we are going to do. Long intro this time, I know. I hope you like this tutorial and you learned something. If you do, you know the drill, guys. Hit the like button. Please subscribe to my channel. It does make a difference. It means the world to me. And thank you so much already to all my patrons for supporting me. I love every single one of you. If you want to support me too, check out the link in the video description. Lots of links today in the video description. And now let's start with the tutorial. All right, so by the time of recording here, I'm using the preview edition of Visual Studio 2022 because this is .NET 8 release candidate 2, but I'm pretty sure that it will work pretty much the same way with the release of .NET 8, the final release version. So please bear with me here. If there are any tiny things that look different, I don't think there will be, but keep in mind, this is the release candidate feel free to add in the comments if there's something different in the final release. Anyways, I want to start with the Blazor web app template here. And let's call this now Blazor app identity dot net eight, because that's what it is, right? A Blazor application using identity for authentication with dot net eight. And in the next step, you see it here, this is still the preview. In your case, this is probably different. Authentication type, this is important now, we choose individual accounts because we get lots of stuff with that automatically out of the box. And then regarding the interactivity type, one thing I have to tell you already, it already works with no interactivity whatsoever because 
the .NET team uses the new static server-side rendering, let's say it's new with .NET 8, for the registration, logging in, all that stuff, all right? So it already works, but if you want to use an account with interactive components, no matter if it's server, WebAssembly, whatever, then of course you can check interactivity here and I will show you how this works in this tutorial. So you can, again, if you don't want to use any interactivity whatsoever, only a form, for instance, using static server-side rendering, then you can just choose none and you're good to go. But otherwise, if you need interactivity, I don't know, for instance, you've got a chart or anything, a data grid, something that just needs that interactivity bonus, let's say, then you can, of course, choose server, WebAssembly or auto. Let me just use auto here because with that, we get both worlds out of the box. So I can show you everything in essence, and then let's just hit create. All right, there we are. And as you can see, we have the Blazor server project here on top and also the client project. If you watched my other tutorial videos, then you know what this new architecture is all about. In essence, the client project is only necessary if you wanna use components using WebAssembly, so just the client no WebSocket stuff whatsoever. And here now the Blazor server project also is a .NET web API or has web API capabilities. You can add controllers here and of course your services, database stuff and so on. And as you can see with individual accounts, we already have something using databases or one database. For instance, here the application DB context which uses, well, Entity Framework, all right? You see it here, there's the reference. And when you also have a look at the dependencies here, then we see regarding the packages, we've got Microsoft Entity Framework Core SQL Server. So SQL Server is used as a provider here. Just one little hint, maybe you wanna use SQL Server Express, available for free, and also the SQL Server Management Studio. This is what I'm going to use in this tutorial. And then with Entity Framework Core Tools, this is important if you wanna use the migrations. And as you can see here, there already is a migrations file called Create Identity Schema. This means that here, all the identity tables will be created. The roles, the users, role claims, many, many stuff. And throughout this tutorial, we will also make changes there meaning we will add a property to the application user and I will show you how you can then get this information in your application. And also I wanna add a role to the user and then show you how you can, well, build a component that can only be accessed then by a specific role, an admin for instance, right? So this is what we're going to do. And now the next step already, before I dive into all these uh, components here, because when you have a look here, components, identity, pages, account, lots of stuff, right? Great thing is this is really Blazor stuff, right? Razor components here, no MVC, some, nothing like that. Before we can actually use all that, well, we have to do something because again, when we have a look at the program CS here, we see that the DB context here is used with a specific connection string, all right? And you see also here, SQL Server is used. So to make this work, what we can do is we can, well, already run a migration, but I don't want this connection string here. I want another one. And again, I'm using SQL Server Express here. So what I can do is simply change that to SQL Express. Database name is also, well, I don't like it. So let's just change this thing to something like Blazor Identity DB. For instance, trusted connection is set to true. And then we also have to trust the server certificate. Let me just change that. So trust server certificate is also true. And then hopefully this should work. All right, because when we run this, let me just show you what will happen. You see it here, typical Blazor design, right? Auth required means, okay, we uh, have to be authenticated to access this page, but first we have to register an account, right? So maybe Tony at stark.com, we enter a password 
and another one to confirm this. We hit register and then this happens. All right, so it says database operation failed while processing the request. Well, in essence, this means we have to apply the migrations and we can do it here, but it does not work, at least in my case. And then here you can see what you can do. Since we have the tools package in our dependencies, we can really just uh, run update database in the package manager console, or as it says here, the side. Alternatively, if you have the .NET EF tools installed, you can also just run this command and this is pretty much the same thing. So let's go back to Visual Studio, open the package manager console, and now really we can uh, stay here at this folder, the solution folder, and then update dash database. All right, so let's see if the connection string is correct. Build already succeeded, this is nice. And you can see all the stuff that is happening here, all the tables that are created. And now let's just open uh, Visual, uh, no, Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio. Ignore the time tracker database here. This is from the .NET Web Academy. When we now refresh, then open the databases, you see Blazor Identity DB. We can open the tables and there they are. This is all identity stuff, all right? And here now, this thing will be interesting, ASP.NET users. For now, there's nobody here. Well, that's not 100% correct. Tony Stark is already here. And this is really interesting because this means that the site, the form, well, it was submitted again after the, the migration or the database has been updated. So I wasn't aware of that, to be honest. So maybe there is something going on here in the app that uh, just reloaded this thing, maybe hot, is it hot reload? Well, hot reload is actually off, turned off in my case. Well, magic. I have no idea why this worked, but this is great. You see Tony Stark, but again, to show you this uh, one more time, first, what we have to do is we have to confirm this account. Yeah, you see it here. Uh, normally you would send a confirmation email, for instance, to the user after registration and then tell this user, hey, please click this link to confirm your email address, your account, because then uh, here you see it, you have this property here, email confirmed is set to false. And let me now say, click here to confirm your account. Beautiful, thank you for confirming your email. We execute the SQL again and now it is set to true. All right, so this is how this stuff works. Now we are able to log in, all right? So here now we can, uh, well, go to the weather page and then for instance, auth required. And then when I just go to Tony at stark.com, enter my top secret password, I hit login. I come back to the uh, return URL. This is already working out of the box. I can access the auth required page. Isn't that great? And the authentication that is used here is cookie authentication, all right? So no JSON web token. You can opt in for a bearer token, which is not a JSON web token. This is something special that Microsoft built here, but they recommend using cookies, all right? The whole world, the whole web world use JSON web tokens. And now everybody is saying again, well, JSON web tokens are not that secure. Please use cookies if you are able to, all right? Then, well, let's just use cookies here. So here you see it, the actual cookie is this thing here, all right? And uh, you can send it with an HTTP only flag and so on. So uh, yeah, and I said it's much more secure. Anyways, logging out does not work in my version here. Get this error here. So let's just remove all the cookies and then we can again go to auth required. And as you can see, it is redirecting us to login with the return URL and we can for instance, also again, register with another account. Let's do this one more time, as I promised. For instance, peter at parker.com. And this is the password, all right. Again, we click here to confirm our account back to a SQL Server Management Studio, execute and we see Peter Parker here. Isn't that nice? So this is the email address and we're confirmed. And again, we can now log in for instance Peter at parkour.com and the password, hit login. Yep. And now we can go to auth required, for instance, and we see our email address, which comes as a claim. All right. And now I will show you how this stuff works behind the scenes in essence. So here again, the, uh, the token 
let's just remove this thing and we are not authenticated again. So back to Visual Studio now. First of all, in the server part here, we go to the program CS and this is now typical identity stuff, all right? In essence, nothing that new, really, if you wanted to use ASP.NET Core Identity before, meaning with .NET 7, for instance, then you had to do similar stuff. So I'm only getting to the important points here, all right? So not want to dive deep into everything here, except maybe this thing. And that's one reason why I chose um, the uh, interactive uh, interactivity mode auto, because with that, we already get these little lines here. Well, it's not much to just add that, but we get interactive server components and WebAssembly components. And when you, by creating the new project, when you just choose WebAssembly or only server, then you have to do this, then add these lines manually if you're changing your mind and you want to use then the other uh, render mode. But with that, then you just already have everything available. Same down here, add interactive server render mode, WebAssembly render mode, and this is also necessary for the uh, rep assembly render mode. If you delete the example component here, the, the counter component, then make sure to change that, all right? So that the app knows what, which assembly you wanna use. One component is enough. You don't have to do this for every web assembly component, just one component, and then you're good to go. All right, now, what else do we see here? Well, Cascading authentication state, this is important for our components to know the authentication state, all right? What does the tooltip say? Adds cascading authentication state to the service collection. This is equivalent to having a cascading authentication state component at the root of your component hierarchy. Yeah, again, necessary so that the authentication state, well, is known throughout the whole application. Then you got the user accessor. Now this is interesting because when we have a look here, the application user, all right, or again, let's start here. We have a DB context, which uses or inherits from the identity DB context. You could also just leave it like that, the identity DB context, then you would use the default identity user entity or the identity user class. But if you wanna use your own custom user class, then you do it like that and add the application user here. It's called application user, inherits from identity user. And now here, and we will do that in a couple of minutes, you can add your own properties, all right? Maybe you wanna know the date of birth or the play, date of place of birth or maybe the team of this person, Avengers or the Justice League, something like that, all right? So you can add this here to the user, add another migration. Again, we will do this in a minute and then uh, this still works with identity. Great stuff. So this is the DB context then, and now you know what the application user is, we already saw that. And then there might be situations, right, where you wanna access that data. Well, it's not default identity user data, so we have a so-called user manager with identity, for instance, that can then access the default properties like the email address or the username or the phone number, which is also default, but for the other stuff, we need the user accessor, for instance. There are different ways, of course, a million ways to access the data, but here you already have it. You have the get required user async method. With that thing, you get the currently authenticated user, all right? Returns that thing here. You see it, it's the application user, could be null, of course, but in essence, it is accessing the current HTTP context and from that, getting the user and or the principle, the claims principle to be more exact. And then it uses the user manager from identity, from the identity framework and gets the user then that you wanna use and then you're able to, well, check the properties there. So this is that magic. Again, other stuff, identity redirect manager. Well, let's forget about that. Not that important for this tutorial. The authentication set provider is very important. All right, I think this is a big question mark for lots of you. How does that now work with the Blazor web app? Before, for instance, with Blazor WebAssembly, we had the authentication state provider and we still have it, of course. And as you can see here in the WebAssembly part, we also have still the method get authentication state async, which well provides the authentication state and also 
adds the claims to the user, all right? And here, what we will do later is we will also add a role, all right? Because the, I don't know, the date of birth, for instance, if you wanna use a custom property, this is not a claim that you would add here. One more claim you would add is probably a role though. So let's do that later as well. And then you've got another authentication state provider, which is this thing here, and this comes from the server. And again, I don't wanna overwhelm you with all that stuff. I think it's not that important for this tutorial, but the most important thing to know is that this authentication state provider persists the authentication state, and let's just say it forwards the information of the current user to the client. And as you can see here, this is the crucial part. And again, we will uh, make a change here where we will also add the role to the claims and then the role will be available on the client. So this, these are the places to look at. And then let's continue. Add authentication. Well, register services required by authentication services, specifies the name of the scheme to use by default when a specific scheme isn't requested important for authentication. Let's just leave it at that. Now this, I think you know now, adding the database context, it first gets the connection string from the app settings JSON. Um, we use the SQL server provider and all right, we have database developer page exception filters. Yeah, good for development, I guess. And now a very important block, add identity core, all right? So with that, we add a speed.net identity. And here again, you can see that we wanna use our application user that inherits from the identity user. So this is important. And as you can see here, require confirmed account. This is the email stuff, right? We did a couple of minutes before that uh, you usually would have to send an email, confirm that thing, or you just change the value in the database, or you set this to false and then it also works. Here we say that we wanna use entity framework, right? With our application DB context, this is great. And we also add the sign-in manager. This is a service of identity and default token providers. I'm not hundred percent sure, but I think this is for the bearer token functionality if you wanna use that. We have an email sender here, did not use it. Again, I think not important for now, but what is very important, and this is new with .NET 8 really, is this little line here, map additional identity endpoints, because this now gives you the option, and I created another video about that. Uh, this gives you the option to add, well, let's say authentication endpoints like register, login, uh, two-factor authentication, manage your account, and so on. Lots and lots of stuff. And this then is here used in this application. And how is this used? Well, again, let's have a look here at the components. Then we've got identity, all right, but even better, pages. And here you already see lots of stuff and also the manage pages, all right? So here, all that stuff is used. And again, I told you that at the beginning of this tutorial, this uses SSR, static server-side rendering. It's actually only server-side rendering, but uh, well, in one of the community standups, the ASP.NET Core team said, maybe we can call it static server-side rendering to, well, to differentiate between really using server-side rendering without WebSockets and Blazor Server then is the server-side rendering with WebSockets, all right? I know maybe still a bit confusing, but again, if you just play around with that, you will get the hang of it. And then maybe in a couple of days, you will begin to love the new Blazor with .NET 8. Anyways, so this is now the login form that you've already seen a couple of minutes ago. And here also the register uh, form. And the great thing is, this is really uh, a stretch goal as they said in the on the .NET blog, this was not planned for .NET 8, actually for .NET 9, but we still have it here. This is great, thank you so much, and congrats to the ASP.NET Core team. This is amazing because now we don't have MVC pages here, we have Razor components, all right? So this is the edit form you know and love. And again, with static server-side rendering, the big difference is here we give this form a name, register for instance. And then down here in the code block, we use this new attribute, supply 
parameter from form. And with that, we know that this, uh, this property here is used in that form. If you have more forms than just one on one side, then you would have to define the name here as well. But we only have one form, so this should work. All right, and this is then, again, the input model. And I think the input model, well, it's not here, but in the login page, there we have it. Model is input, and when we go there, yeah, here we see the uh, input again, supply parameter from form, this is our model. And here it's, uh, this is actually the class for the login. All right, and the same, I also saw here at the index. Of course, I'm not going through every, I, it did not, I haven't yet uh, looked at all the pages, but I think uh, for this tutorial here, these are the most important ones, login register, and then maybe here manage your account. And here it's the same thing. You have the input model here and uh, there you see this little small thing. And now let's add, I'd say a custom property. All right, date of birth maybe. And then what I would like to do is, well, implement the whole logic, how to change this thing then on that manage page. All right. So again, what we have to do is first, let's have a look for our application user. And here now let's just add another property. So prop, we can use date only, which is another bill and say this is date of birth. All right. So this would be the first step. And then we first or the next step would then be to add a new migration. All right. So what we can do is simply add migration and say date of birth edit, we hit return, everything is saved, build is started, the app is still running. So I'm not sure if this will work when the app is running. Let's just see. Oh, this looked great. And you already see the new migration file here. It was opened for us. I think this is new, isn't it? Date of birth. Yep. And we've got two methods. If you're not familiar with code first migration, one for well applying this migration and another one for rolling it back. And here you see it would just add another column to the ASP.NET users table type is date. It is nullable. And again, if you want to roll back this, it would simply drop that column date of birth looks great to me. So again, let's just say update database. This looks good. So let's go back to here and uh, refresh this thing. Tables ASP.NET users and the columns and you can now see in date of birth. This is our beautiful new column. We can of course have a look at the data here. And now here we see the date of birth. Now we don't want to change it here in the database. Of course, we want to do that in our application. All right. So now what we can do is again, we go to our manage index page and I want to add the date of birth. So here now let's just add this property date only and call this date of birth. Now, how do we get the current value? Well, we've got the uninitialized async. I'm again, sure you're familiar with that. Just real quick for information. If you are not familiar, we have a couple of lifecycle methods in blazer three are the most important ones on initialized on parameter set and on after render. Now let's just say we've got the uninitialized async here that we want to use, meaning when this component is initialized, we do some stuff, right? And as you can see here, we have our input model. We're using this beautiful coalescing. I'm not sure how to pronounce that uh, operator. And this just means if this thing is null, then we will just initialize or create a new instance of the input model. But if it already has a value, then we don't. All right. We just use that value here. And after that, we're using, you see it here, right? You paid attention. So, you know, the user accessor with that thing, we get the current user. And with the help of the identity user manager, we get the username and the phone number. And now we also want to set the date of birth to our model. Well, we already have the user thanks to our user manager. So what we can do is we can simply say input date of birth. Again, this beautiful operator. So we have the user with date of birth. Great. This is how we get the current value. Now, again, let's have a look at the form. We have 
on valid submit async. This is the method that we want to use on a valid submit. So what we then do, or real quick, what does a valid submit mean? Well, we have the data annotations validator here, meaning that some values well, are for instance required, or they have to have a specific specific format like the email address, right? And this can be checked here automatically. And if, well, something is not correct, then we will see an error message. And that's why on valid submit, we could also do it like that on submit. And then it doesn't really matter if the form is valid or not it would call the on valid submit async. But here now we are using validation, which is nice. So now here you can see on valid submit async, what you want to do is we want to set the new phone number, but now we also want to set the new date of birth. All right. And what we can do here instead of this block, well, we can simply change the value, all the values we want to change for our user and then call the update async method of the user manager from identity. And then well, see if the result or the update succeeded or not. So how would we do that? Well, we can simply say user phone number is now the input phone number, then user date of birth is now the input date of birth, right? And then we can say, update result is now wait user manager and then simply update async and we want to update the complete user here and now we can use actually this thing here we already have and just check if update result succeeded and if not we redirect to a page with the status unexpected error when trying to set, well, let's say update the user, almost the user. All right. Then sign in manager, refresh, sign in async. All right. And redirect to current page with status. Your profile has been updated. One more thing is necessary. We of course need a component to change the date. So what we can do is we can simply copy this block here. Since we're using a date only type now, instead of input text, we use input date. Let's say the ID is date of birth. Copy that thing, paste it here as well. Again, date of birth it is. Placeholder, well, let's just remove the placeholder. Then here we have date of birth and here the validation message also date of birth now. And I hope that's it. Let's just restart the application and try that. It's rebuilding. We have an error, all right? That's why it took so long. Okay, somewhere the semicolon is missing. Of course, why didn't you tell me guys? Now we should be good to go. Hopefully, yep, it's rebuilding. Nice. Okay. So now who should it be? Tony Stark, maybe Tony Stark.com logging in. All right. And now drum roll, we go to Yeah. So now here we have the phone number and the date. What happens if I just click save? Okay. So here you see the validation in action, right? We have to enter a phone number and a date of birth. Now for the phone number, I don't know the phone number. But regarding the date, pretty sure this is the one. All right, so you see we also have a date, date time, no, a date picker here. What happens now if we hit save? Well, it's saved. Your profile has been updated. Well, you read that before, right? That thing. That is the message. Isn't that nice? And we can now refresh this thing and we have our data here. And again, just double check here in the database. And now we have the date of birth and also the phone number. Isn't that nice? And with that, you have lots of power because now you can just build the user you want, the user object you want and do anything you want with that thing. All right. But this is not all. I've got one more thing and this shall be the roles because I'm really, really sure that you guys want to know, okay, authentication is nice, but what about authorization, not authentication, authorization. 
So what if I want to say this page here should only be accessed by an administrator? Well, let's just do that. It's not that hard, but you just have to know how it works. And after the next couple of minutes, you know how it works. But the first thing we have to do is we go to the uh, program CS again. So here on the server, we have to add one little line after add identity core. Real quick, the .NET Web Academy opens its doors for enrollment today, but only for two weeks. And after this enrollment period, the doors will be closed for at least three months. So check out the link in the video description if you're interested. This time it's getting huge. You get access to the already existing 2023 edition of the .NET Web Academy, where we built a full fledged full stack time tracking application with .NET 7 and Blazor WebAssembly. And now there are updated lectures and chapters regarding .NET 8. So you will know how to do all that already with .NET 8. But additionally to that, you get also early access to the 2024 edition, a complete new program that will use, of course, .NET 8 and all its new Blazor capabilities, all the render mode, the identity stuff, lots and lots of stuff to learn. Brand new program, brand new application that we're going to build. Early access, meaning, well, .NET is available since today, so I need some time to build this thing. But with that, you also get access to the community where you can, of course, also, well, have the option and the power to change the stuff that I will create, right? So if you have certain ideas you want to see in the application, just tell me that in the community, and then I'm more than happy to create the videos and well, adapt the lectures, the chapters, the whole application that we're going to build. So this is what you get with the .NET Web Academy, two big, big programs that will make you a .NET Web developer, front end, back end, database stuff, everything there, deployment to Azure, and also the community. Please check out the link in the video description. Looking forward to seeing you in the Academy. And now let's continue with the tutorial. We now want to tell the identity framework that we also want to use roles. They're not there by default. This is important, guys. So add roles. And again, you can use your own class or you just use the default identity role. All right. And of course, at the parenthesis. And here, let's have a look. Yeah, there it is. Identity role string, right, with an ID name and so on. And this is then represented in the table. So what we can now do first here in the database, we have here the, the beautiful ID for Tony. Let's just say Tony, okay? We are using Tony here for this example. And now we go to ASP.NET roles. So here we define the roles. If you wanna use code for that, there is a roles manager, comes with uh, the identity framework out of the box, and then you can use this manager to add roles, remove roles and so on. But you know, let's just do that a bit quicker. And uh, we do it here in the database. So here, what we have to do is we have to also add an ID. I want to add that uh, another GUID, but of course, not exactly the same, something like that, maybe. And now let's just say this is an admin normalize is also this thing. So this is now the admin role. And to use that role for a user, well, here's the ASP.NET user roles table. So this is just the connection with foreign keys. You can also see it here, right, two foreign keys and the user ID and the role ID together is also a primary key. So here now we just put the uh, user ID and also the role ID I just added here for this little example. And now Tony Stark should be an administrator. All right, this is everything you have to do at the database or in the database. And now again, back to the code here, we have another class, which is important for us. And this is the user info. All right, and here in the user info, we have the user ID and the email, but we also want to add the role now. So another property required string. Is it really required? Well, let's let's just test that. All right. Here's the role. Save that. And now again, I know you paid attention, right? We have the authentication state provider, the persisting revalidating authentication state provider. And here now we have to add this role as well. You can already see here, there's something missing, right? We have to set the role. So first, how do we get it? Well, 
we just say var role is now the principle that we have from our HTTP context, or also here the authentication state then, and we want to find the role, that one, the role claim type. All right, so here you can see email claim type, username, user ID, and the role. And I think that's pretty much it. Okay, security stamp is also there. But I think the one that you want and need is the role claim type. And then down here, you can just say a role is role. So many roles. Okay, that's that. And now we go to the client and here now the persistent authentication state provider. Again, if you're used to WebAssembly, Blazor WebAssembly, then you know what's going on here. So let me just copy that line, paste it here. And we have, again, a couple of claim types, of course, but the role is the one that we want to use here and also set it like that. And now it's getting interesting. I haven't told you that actually. If you want to secure a page so that only authorized users can access this thing, syntax highlighting not working here, have preview five. By the way, I know that this update is telling me, or this notification is telling me that there is a preview six, but I'm a bit afraid. Don't, not, not sure if this would be the right decision. After that tutorial, I will update, promise. Now here, we can also say only admins should have access to the whole page, or what we can also do is we can just say a specific authorized view should only be accessed by administrators, all right? Let's just try that first. So here now we just say roles and then admin. See that syntax highlighting, no intelligence. I don't know what's going on there, but let's just try that. And it is rebuilding. All right, access denied, not available. We have to log out. See that this little bug not working in RC2, but I'm pretty sure they fixed it with the final release. So let me just remove the, uh, the cookie there. Now we're not logged in, all right? Okay, so now we said that we have to be administrator. Of course, we also have to, this is important, if you're developing this and testing that and you're playing around with roles and I don't know, any kind of authorization and you already are authenticated, you logged in a user, but you changed something about that user, the cookie is still the same, all right? So it could be the case that you're wondering, hey, I set the admin role to that user, but I'm still not able to access that page. Why is that? Well, let's try to just log out, log in, the equivalent of, have you tried turning it off and on again? And uh, then it might work. So let's try that. Tony at stark.com with that password here. And uh, maybe we can make this a bit smaller. So now we are at the manage page. We can go to auth required and we are able to access this page, okay, because we have the admin role. Now let's change that and maybe just say only admin two is allowed to access that page. Let me first go back to the weather page for instance and we restart the application. It is rebuilding. And now what we expect is when we go to auth required that it would, well, not work. We go here and yep, access denied looks a bit buggy here, account access denied, not available it seems, 404 not found, but this says, well, this user is not allowed to access that page. Of course, we could do that a bit, well, more beautiful, let's say. Restart it again, weather, and now, auth required, we can go there. Isn't that nice, all right? So that's that, this is the complete page. But what now about the authorized view? Well, let's just copy this and paste it down here. Now here we can do something similar. We just say roles and then also admin. And here now we say you are an admin. Isn't that great? So now let's restart the application. You are an admin. Works just like that. Again, admin two, save that, restart the application not working or you're not able to see this, all right? So this is how you can now also use roles with identity or individual accounts with the Blazor Web App template. It works out of the box. Lots and lots of 
possibilities here, also with two-factor authentication, for instance. Again, you can change your managed page. It is Blazor, all right? So you can, you know it, you can do anything here, change the password, you can change the design. For instance, with Tailwind CSS, we use Tailwind CSS, by the way, in the .NET Web Academy. So lots and lots of stuff that is already there, there for you, for us. You can download the personal data and so on. So again, lots and lots of stuff that just works. I love that. Tell me what you think about all that. Do you have questions? Of course, I didn't build this, so I have to dig deep as well when you have questions and I try to answer your questions. And yeah, again, it would be really interesting to know what you think about the new Blazor in .NET 8 and now here the identity uh, option for us as the developers using Blazor now with .NET 8. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to, again, hit the like button. Subscribe to my channel, please, guys. Would mean the world to me. If you want to support me even further, then check out the link in the video description for my Patreon page. And don't forget the Dot and Web Academy. Maybe you're interested. Would love to see you there. Really looking forward to. And uh, the link also in the video description. Again, thank you so much for watching. And I hope I see you next time. Take care.